Hello and welcome to Connected with Latham, where we discuss ideas, legal developments and business trends shaping the global economy. Thank you for joining us for an episode of our FinTech Focus series. I'm Simon Hawkins, a counsel in Latham's Hong Kong office, where I practice in the firm's Financial Institutions Group and the FinTech Industry Group. I'm also co-chair of the firm's Global Blockchain and Cryptocurrency Task Force. In this episode, we're talking about evolving themes in crypto regulation. And joining me for this discussion are my friends and colleagues, Yvette Valdez, a partner in our New York office, and Stuart Davis, a partner in our London office. Yvette and Stuart, thanks very much for joining me. So on the first theme to get us started, we're talking about maturing regulatory frameworks for cryptocurrencies um, and blockchain generally. Um, so what we're seeing is globally a greater push towards regulation of crypto and some significant new regulatory regimes that were announced in 2020. So what are we seeing from the respective markets in which we practice? Uh, Stuart, maybe you can kick us off to talk about the markets in crypto assets regulation. Sure, Simon. The developing theme um, for crypto regulation in the EU, first and foremost, came with anti-money laundering regulation and a new directive called the Fifth Money Laundering Directive. AMR KYC, I think, was seen as one of the most important challenges for regulators to address in Europe in relation to crypto. But since MLD5 came into force, there has been a really substantive rethink around the nature of so-called unregulated crypto assets and the regulatory regime which should sit around them. That has culminated in the European Commission publishing a proposal for a European regulation called the Markets and Crypto Assets Regulation. And this creates a fulsome regulatory regime for both crypto asset service providers, that's anyone who deals in crypto assets or provides other forms of regulated services in crypto assets, similar to an investment firm in, in Europe, um, as well as ICO issuers and issuers of stable coins, two types of stable coins specifically, asset-backed stable coins and e-money-backed stable coins or fiat-backed stable coins. The upshot of this new proposed regulation is that so-called unregulated crypto assets will no longer be unregulated and they will be subject to a regulatory regime which is similar to the regulatory regime in Europe that applies to investment firms, i.e. investment banks, with some idiosyncrasies aimed at mitigating a range of perceived risks that apply specifically to crypto assets, such as market stability risks, which apply to stable coins, customer disclosure risks, which apply to ICOs, and risks around safeguarding of assets for crypto asset service providers and custodians. In terms of timing, um, it's not yet hard baked into the regime, the European Parliament and the European the EU Commission need to sign off on the regime and there'll be a significant amendment process as the legislative regime goes through its various stages. But the Commission intends that the new regime comes into force by 2024. And who's going to be subject to the, the regulation in terms of who does it apply to from an investor perspective? Is it going to include both the retail and the institutional segments? Um, it will... In involve regulation of any type of crypto asset service, um, regardless of whether it's the services being provided on an institutional or retail basis, with a couple of caveats. Um, one is that there are similar exemptions um, in relation to the issuance of crypto assets, which apply currently in relation to the issuance of securities, the so-called public offer exemptions. One of those exemptions is if you um, make a public offer of securities to so-called qualified investors, i.e. professional investors, institutional investors, um, then you won't fall within the scope of the prospectus requirements. 
There's a similar exemption baked into the issuance regime in MICA. Thanks for that, Stuart. Um, over in Hong Kong, um, there's been some regulatory developments here as well in relation to the regulation of um, cryptocurrency trading. Um, so it's been a year now since the Hong Kong Securities and Futures Commission, the SFC, announced a new regulatory regime for virtual asset exchanges that facilitate trading in security tokens. So those are, are crypto assets that fall within the traditional definitions of securities. Um, but now uh, the regulators turned its sights on the regulation of non-security virtual assets. And it's outlined a new regulatory framework to formalize and directly regulate trading of virtual assets like Bitcoin and Ether. There's currently a consultation paper that's been issued that outlines this new regulatory framework that would bring operators of virtual asset exchanges within the formal regulatory perimeter of the SFC for the first time. The new regulatory framework implements the Financial Action Task Force requirement to regulate virtual asset service providers for AML and counter-terrorist financing purposes. Uh, under the proposals, the, the new regime would require centralized virtual asset exchanges that operate in Hong Kong or actively market their virtual asset services to the public of Hong Kong to become licensed by the SFC. They would be subject to similar regulatory requirements to the requirements that apply to virtual asset exchanges trading in securities. Um, in particular, they'd only be allowed to offer their services to customers that qualify as professional investors, meaning that the retail segment would be excluded or precluded from dealing with these licensed virtual asset exchanges. The consultation period for the new regulatory framework runs until the end of January 2021, and we expect that the new regime could come into effect um, during the course of the next Legislative Council year in Hong Kong during 2021. Um, after the regimes come into effect and becomes law, there'll be a transitional period of 180 days to allow market participants to either apply for the new license from the SFC um, or withdraw from the market completely. In terms of the scope of the regime, uh, the, the consultation paper specifically excludes peer-to-peer -peer trading platforms. So platforms that only provide a forum for buyers and sellers of virtual assets to post their bids and offers uh, without any automatic matching mechanism um, would be excluded from the regime. So essentially decentralized exchanges would not be capable of being licensed under the new virtual asset uh, exchange licensing regime. Uh, also excluded are central bank digital currencies. Um, and so that implies that central bank digital currencies, uh, when they are live and um, possible to uh, transact in Hong Kong, uh, would not fall within the definition of virtual asset. And so someone facilitating trading in central bank digital currencies would not need to be licensed by the SFC under the new regime. And um, this implies that central bank digital currencies would in fact be treated as money um, under the existing regulatory framework that applies to uh, deposit taking and stored value facilities. Yvette, um, how about decentralized finance? Have regulators got to grips with this and, and where do we see the DeFi markets going? Yeah, thanks, Simon. So I think it's, it's important to note that generally, just to back up for a little bit, in the U.S., our regulatory regime is made up of, of many different regulators. So when we think of decentralized finance, um, each regulator is looking at it from its own sort of regulatory ambit. Uh, and jurisdictional scope. And, and so what we do know from, from statements that have been made from various regulators, uh, in particular, Chairman Turbert from the CFTC, um, and it, it is that there is a focus on understanding DeFi, understanding the market players, and, and ensuring that regulated activity um, or, or that activity that should otherwise be regulated is not actually taking place. But, but one of the 
I guess, concerns in the market and also, I believe, to, to the credit of the regulators, recognition by the regulators is that our rules are not really shaped at the moment to address many of these different financial technologies that are emerging in the DeFi space, right? And that's coupled with um, being able to peer-to-peer trade crypto, to making other sort of positions or investments um, in in the, the the digital asset space, but from a decentralized way. So we think about that, you know, on a peer-to-peer sort of network. Um, and so there's the recognition that more work needs to be done by the regulators. One, in really understanding the technology um, and its its potential and what it potentially could move to and trying to accommodate the rules and, and further in advance the dialogue with the market um, to be able to, where necessary, apply uh, the regulatory regime and the supervisory authority to ensure that otherwise um, activity that would otherwise be regulated under a centralized regime shouldn't would be regulated in the DeFi space at all. And that's that's sort of the that's the view that we've seen and the way that the regulators have really approached regulation of crypto generally, right? So this is really in keeping uh, thematically with the position and the evolution of the regulatory response here in the United States. There is the there is the development of our regulatory regime that is composed of many different regulators who are continuing to propose rules, provide additional guidance as to how the crypto market fits within their rules and the expectation that those market participants uh, need to comply and abide with those rules as additional rules are proposed, finalized, and additional guidance as to the application of those rules to the particular crypto or, or DeFi space. I mean, certainly in Hong Kong, the regulators, when they've been looking to um, develop regulatory frameworks for supervising um, crypto related activities, have uh, expressly excluded uh, DeFi, um, I think because it's, you know, they, they haven't come up with a solution for how to regulate it um, in, in the ways that you've just been describing. It, it poses difficulties to fit within the traditional frameworks for regulatory supervision. Is that is that something that the US regulators, are, are they exploring a sort of new way to regulate DeFi or is, is it kind of for the moment just being excluded as well? Yeah, good question. So I think the the position that the regulators have have typically taken and are taking um, and and are really sort of proposing today, um, at least from the statements from the regulators that we see, is that we've tackled this issue before. We have had developments in technologies. We've had market evolve out of, you know, the applicable rules with the need to then reapply Um, propose new regulation, clarify regulation as to how it would apply today with, you know, the the evolving technology or the evolving market. And so really in the U.S., we see this as an issue that we've tackled before and that we can sort of accommodate the rules, apply them where necessary, um, and not necessarily always look to just creating a new uh, regulatory regime. Now, that is certainly a possibility and is a is it has certainly been spoken about on this legislative floor. There is no one specific regulator that would necessarily take ambit of that. But I think that would be a break from her historical precedent, which is that our supervisory authority, our regulators um, work together to sort of develop rules and regulation and are responsive to the market and the way that it evolves. And so the regulators really see themselves as trying to create smart regulation. Um, and many have made open statements about not wanting to impede uh, evolution of technology and the development of this market, but ensuring that we're still um, applying rules where necessary and, and making smart regulation in order to help the development of these technologies. So I think in short, the answer is no, there is no move to create necessarily this separate regulatory regime, but to understand the new technologies and to fit them within our current schema, because we believe that, um, you know, we've done this before and it's an issue that we can continue to tackle as as the markets evolve. And Stuart, we've, um, for 
certainly for a couple of years, uh, a couple of years ago, when we saw the ICO boom in 2017 and 2018, um, we saw a lot of jurisdiction shopping um, and regulatory arbitrage. So people looking for the most favorable or least regulated jurisdictions uh, in which to base their token issuers than to try and avoid regulation. Do you think we're now that we're seeing these regulatory frameworks come into effect all, all over the world? Um, is that is it the end of regulatory arbitrage and the end of that sort of jurisdiction shopping? Well, I think you've really hit the nail on the head as to the core purpose for why the Commission is proposing MICA. Now, the regulatory framework in the EU has become increasingly fragmented with regards to crypto. Um, and that hasn't been aided by the Fifth Money Laundering Directive, where member states have implemented it in a very uh, bespoke way to their own jurisdictions so that um, if you are a crypto asset service provider in the EU, you will potentially meet a range of different um, anti-money laundering regimes which you may need to comply with depending on where your customers are based. And the Commission has said that this is a form of market failure and that in order for the market to fully develop, and the Commission does want it to fully develop, it sees this as a potentially lucrative market for the EU and a, a market which will help the EU's digital services ecosystem um, to, to, to sort of fully develop, um, it sees a regulation in the EU as necessary to prevent that type of regulatory arbitrage. Um, and it's not just service providers or market participants that have caused regulatory arbitrage. It's also legislators in the EU who have implemented different regulatory frameworks which are more specific to their own member states. A regulation in the EU, it applies directly across all member states. So that means it doesn't need any uh, member state internal implementation steps or measures. So the sh you as a crypto market participant should be able to look at the text of MICA and any EU level guidance which is produced by the EU authorities as the substantive source of legislation for your business when it comes into force in a way in which you cannot do today. Will that mean that this is the end of regulatory arbitrage? I don't think so. And there are a couple of reasons for that. One, MICA only applies in the EU. And the EU covers you know, a substantial um, area and a substantial trading block, but it will not lead, I don't believe, to equivalent standards being, um, being adopted globally which is truly what we would need in order to prevent arbitrage. But the second reason is also, of course, Brexit and the potential for the UK um, sitting on Europe's doorstep as a third country firm to materially diverge from the EU standards. There's a question as to whether the UK will ever implement MICA. And the level of competition between the UK and the EU post-Brexit um, could lead to uh, potential for arbitrage between the two states, the UK being the relative minnow and, and the EU being the large trading block across the channel. So turning to our second theme to discuss is heightened enforcement activity. Um, and whether this is a theme we're seeing globally, um, certainly it's something we have seen a lot of in the US. And so maybe Yvette, we'll start with you to, to kick us off on what we're seeing in terms of enforcement trends. Yeah, so I think, you know, there has been um, much more focus on enforcement from, from various regulators um, and, and, and also the DOJ. Um, you know, there, this is in keeping with, I think, US uh, historical precedent, right? The, the, the strength of the supervisory authority and the regulatory regime in the U.S. has very much been historically in its ability to police it and ensure compliance. And so um, 
the 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 enforcement trends that we have seen um, from the various regulators is certainly uh, a moment in time where the regulators are comfortable enough that there has been enough interpretive guidance, enough notice that the expectation is is that we're certainly going to uh, police the markets. And there's also a precedent. Um, where necessary and, and, and where deemed the appropriate action, where the regulators will regulate through enforcement, which we've certainly seen um, earlier in, in the crypto history as well. We've seen a focus by the regulators on um, anti-money laundering and policing terrorist, um, terrorism activity. In, in the crypto markets. Um, and I think we'll, we're going to continue to see that activity um, and, and the enforcement of the, the crypto markets in such way from, from numerous regulators. And Stuart, we've heard from Yvette about the uh, heightened enforcement activity, sort of continuous enforcement activity in the US. Um, what's the status of enforcement in the EU? So we haven't seen too many significant enforcement actions in the EU. Um, and I'll talk specifically about the UK. Um, the UK regulator is a very tech savvy regulator. And um, it has produced detailed guidance around the characterization of crypto assets, um, which has enabled crypto asset service providers and issuers um, to have much more legal certainty well in, ahead, in, in advance of MICA. Um, and I think that has meant that for large part, the market in the UK um, has, has taken steps to be um, compliant from a regulatory perspective, so to speak. The regulator, because of the inherent uncertainty I believe, in, in the crypto asset space, has not been quick to jump on the enforcement bandwagon, but it has made it very clear that service providers and issuers need to be mindful of their regulatory obligations and need to make sure that if they um, are performing a regulated activity, they need to get a license. What we've seen is the regulator publishing a number of warnings of that ilk. And we've also seen the regulator publishing a number of statements relating to specific firms where it believes that the firm is acting without a regulatory permission and it will effectively publicly censure that issuer or service provider on its website for all to see. It's not clear whether enforcement activity is going on in the background when such statements are published. Um, but it is clear that the regulator is monitoring the market and it's taking a view as to whether it believes that some service providers are providing services without a licence. And for the Asia perspective, um, similar to what Stuart has described for the EU, um, we certainly haven't seen the same levels of enforcement activity um, that have been witnessed in the US as described uh, by Yvette. Instead, in Hong Kong and Singapore, we've seen numerous um, statements and notices from the regulators in the respective jurisdictions um, warning against uh, specific um, transactions, uh, typically ICOs, and most of these notices came out uh, more than a year ago, 18 months ago. Um, but we haven't seen actual uh, clear enforcement action and proceedings and um, uh, sanctions being levied against uh, unlicensed uh, players in the market, so whether it's an unlicensed uh, token sale or an unlicensed um, trading platform, um, and more investor kind of protection measures instead. So warning investors uh, that they should be very cautious about investing in cryptocurrencies and that they should do their diligence if they're going to do that, um, but, but not the sort of a strict enforcement action as we've seen in, in other markets, notably the US. Stuart, Yvette, thank you very much for your insights today. And thank you all for listening to this episode in our Connected with Latham podcast series. More on this topic can be found on our fintech blog at lw.com. 
You can subscribe and listen to new and archived episodes of Latham's podcasts on lw.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen to podcasts. If you'd like more information about any of the topics discussed in this podcast, please email us from links located in the show description. We hope you'll join us again next time. This podcast is provided as a service of Latham & Watkins, LLP. Listening to this podcast does not create an attorney-client relationship between you and Latham & Watkins, LLP, and you should not send confidential information to Latham & Watkins, LLP. While we make every effort to assure that the content of this podcast is accurate, comprehensive, and current, we do not warrant or guarantee any of those things. And you may not rely on this podcast as a substitute for legal research and or consulting a qualified attorney. Listening to this podcast is not a substitute for engaging a lawyer to advise you on your individual needs. Should you require legal advice on the issues covered in this podcast, please consult a qualified attorney. Under New York's Code of Professional Responsibility, portions of this communication contain attorney advertising. Prior results do not guarantee a similar outcome. Results depend upon a variety of factors unique to each representation. Please direct all inquiries regarding the conduct of Latham & Watkins attorneys under the New York's disciplinary rules to Latham & Watkins, LLP, 885 3rd Avenue, New York, New York, 10022-4834, phone number 1212-906-1200.